Clara Nua, a Clara Public Talk, so surely, on Clara Radio. Um, welcome to the new edition of Social Republican Radio. Um, this edition will have a brief reports on Irish news, international news and upcoming events. So first, just a brief report on Lee Mallow's commemoration held last Saturday, 7th of December. Dozens of Socialist Republicans gathered at the grave of Lee Mallows and held a commemoration for Mallows and the four martyrs who were executed by the counter-revolutionary Free State establishment. Um, Pargo Fariel chaired the proceedings and Sean Doyle gave an oration. During the oration, Sean Doyle um, spoke um, about the life of Lee Mallows and his contribution and his defence of the Irish Republic and also the Socialist Republican position on dealing with the Free State Establishment and Imperialist Occupied Six County State and call, called for a boycott of all upcoming um, actions to both institutions. Um, other Irish news, in the past week in the Special Criminal Court, two Republicans, Lara Murphy and Ray Kennedy, were acquitted of IRA membership and for listeners who might not be in the know, the special criminal courts were set up during the 1930s under emergency legislation and have been used since then to intern political activists and republicans, especially during the 1970s where their powers were extended. Um, and all it takes in the special criminal court is for a police chief superintendent to give his opinion that someone is a member of an illegal organization and that can give someone um, a jail sentence based on membership. And for this reason, we'd call on all social Republicans, Republicans or civil rights activists to get involved in the Abolish the Special Criminal Courts campaign. But with the recent acquittal of these two individuals, there could be a possibility in future cases that um, evidence supplied by the state could be in question, as the secret evidence that the state tried to provide in this case wasn't accepted by the court and the, the two activists were acquitted of the charges of membership of an illegal organisation. Um, upcoming events, this coming Saturday, 14th of December, there will be an anti-racist demonstration held outside Leicester House. We call on all political activists, all anti-racists, Irish Republicans and Social Republicans to try attend that event um, and to be there for 1 o'clock, at, no, 12 o'clock I think, at Leicester House. Um, international news, last Saturday the 7th of December, the New People's Army in the Philippines um, engaged the Philippine National Army and assassinated one soldier and wounded another member of the 49th Infantry Battalion. The New People's Army in the Philippines will be um, a Maoist insurgency, Maoist movement who have been engaged in an armed struggle for, for the past 40 years and I think it would be fair to say maybe that the Maoist current or tendency internationally now is possibly the only revolutionary tendency engaged in revolutionary struggle. Um, I, I would guess that's, yeah, I would guess that's uh, true at the moment. I mean, it wasn't in the past, uh, I guess, in the, 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 the heyday, in the 1960s, let's say, there's lo there was lots of, uh, it was a time of anti-colonial uh, revolution all over the place, of which Maoists were, were just uh, one, one part of it, but, um, I know, unfortunately, yeah, I think a lot of the world has gone, you know, revolutionary movements around the world have gone backwards. And the only couple of uh, revolutionary movements still engaged are, are, are Maoist, which I think it probably it says something. Yeah, um, I think the Maoism as an ideology, ideology as well is the fact that it, it's like a roadmap or framework for a revolution that is, has clear principles and especially in the time of post-modernism post now, where there's so many different movements and, I suppose, contradictions among people. A lot of the contradictions are among the people now, not necessarily, um, these, like you said yourself, at one time the anti-imperialist struggle was very strong in the 60s and early 70s possibly, where the anti-imperialist movement at the moment is, isn't, isn't being led by revolutionary movements or isn't being led by communists groups anymore, so I think a lot of these Maoist organisations kind of refer back to basic principles of revolutionary socialism, revolutionary communism that have been lost, I suppose, a lot, especially in the past 20, 30 years. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Hopefully, the world is coming to a new, like, revolutionary, uh, you know, maybe we're at the start of a, a new revolutionary wave. I, I certainly hope so, because uh, if we're not, then we're pretty, the world is, is pretty screwed, because we need to uh, destroy capitalism before it uh, creates mass extinction of, of most uh, life. Um, I mean, like, let's face it, like, a lot of the, the Maoist movements are, are you know, are, are relatively, are, they aren't particularly strong, um, but, you know, if, if it's still, like, uh, I think it's a, it, it's, the, it's the right way for um, new revolutionary movements to grow. Like, it's, it's the basis to, to grow from. And, I mean, I mean just, just to, to think about it, like, the, um, the first meeting of the Chinese Communist Party, I think, in, the in 1920 or something like that, had, like, 200 people. And within a couple of you know, it, it took them twenty years to build up their, um, their 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 people their their people's army and their and their uh, revolutionary movement. But you know they got, got and then soon they had millions in a very powerful revolutionary um, movement that was able to sweep away um, all kinds of powers. So even even if uh, things are very are very small, uh, they can grow if it has the right. Um, guiding ideology they can grow very very well yeah as i said i think it might be a trotsky um call actually that the night is always dark before the dawn right <laughs> but yeah i always look like to look at revolutionary tendencies as international i always considered even going back when i started becoming a political activist that there was struggles in india the maoist and sergi there and in the philippines and to a certain extent in peru that that's where a revolutionary struggle and um, genuine revolutionary forces were taking on the state. Possibly at the moment, those movements are, what in Mao's terminology, possibly in a strategic defensive at the moment. But they they still exist. And for the example, for the Philippines, they've been engaged in that struggle for for decades at the moment. Um, so I think the fact that this Maoist um, Revolution movements that were leading the struggle to achieve socialism at the moment also says a lot. A lot of the other, most other so called revolutionary or socialist movements are, are completely reformist or um, have just reverted into electoral politics or revert back to tinkering with the system. You, their stated objective isn't the complete ab abolition of capitalism or the, the wage system. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I mean, like, it can seem strange maybe to people why Maoists take such a strong line against revisionism, but it, it, it does make sense in terms of, if you look at all of these uh, revolutionary movements, be they communist or not, they've, they've all, like, they make kind of fundamental compromises, and you can see the results, like, they've all just collapsed into, uh, co collapsed back to the, into the thing that they were supposedly fighting against, and so it's just, uh, like, no matter, no matter, uh, no matter what your uh, tendency, if you're a revolutionary, you need to combat this kind of compromise and this kind of revisionism, I guess, just to, to say uh, Marxist or Maoist would, would mean revisionism means that the revolutionary science of, of Marxism is being revised to, to, to pull out the revolutionary part from it. So they just become, it becomes reformist. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that does hold true, like, you know, in, I, I think like in, in Ireland or in other places which didn't necessarily have like it wasn't necessarily Marxist led, but they were revolutionary and anti colonial. But when they when they pulled the revolutionary struggle out of it, then um, things collapsed very quickly. So I think yeah, if we want to build our revolutionary movements on solid foundations, we, we all need to uh, take these things into in, in, into uh, build it in this way that combats this kind of um, decaying from the from the from the center from from the, from the heart of it. Yeah, and. Um... Like as people talk about ideologies, I think it's important as well that it's not just mechanically applied to whatever country. And uh, personally, I see there's a lot of um, transfer or overlapping of, um, I suppose, tactic strategy or ideology between Maoism and traditional Irish Republican um, positions, such as Irish Republican position of abstentionism, the Maoist position of boycott of elections and we saw in Peru the initiation of the people struggling there began with a boycott of the elections, a more direct form of boycott possibly to the elections but we saw in the recent by-elections in the free state in 26 counties that during the four by-elections the highest turnout 
percentage of turnout of those registered to vote was in Wexford where 35% of people bothered to go out and vote. So even by the, the standards of the establishment or the ruling class, they don't have a mandate to rule. And we see that happening throughout the state and throughout 26 counties and the six occupied counties that people are completely turning their backs to the system that exists at the moment. So in, in, that, in that way, um, calling for a boycott is really a mass line and, um, and part of a now a strategy of um, from the people to the people. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree, I, I agree with that. I think uh, I guess the, the the next challenge is to turn this apathy and this rejection of the system into something active. Um, or how do we how do we uh, tap into the the people's energy and uh, and build movements to challenge uh, to challenge the free state or the state that we're under. Yeah, th that's probably the biggest challenge, probably for for revolutionaries. And I think I said in the last episode on the uh, social public radio that um, if the same people who don't go out and vote during the water tax campaign and different ca political campaigns that uh, happened over the past number of years, people who didn't go out and vote were the the most active activists who physically stopped water being privatised and physically stopped the police force coming into their state. So it's it's not a case that if you don't vote you're not political. It's, it's more of a case that if you don't vote you're 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 more um, politically astute or you're more in tune of what's going on in the world at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just found it myself like by it's it's actually like quite uh, liberating to some extent, not not bothering to pay any attention to these elections, which never go anywhere and they're totally meaningless. Like once you uh, stop paying attention to this stuff, it frees up a lot of your time, and you can and, and you start to realise like what a what a pointless, like not even very funny uh, show that was, and you can actually put your energy into something more uh, but more interesting thing, more effective and better better stuff. So. Uh, I suppose we shouldn't forget either that the uh, tactic of boycott was started in Ireland where um, farmers farmers boycotted Captain Boycott and um, the west of Ireland completely ignored them, completely shunned them. Um, so it shouldn't be forgotten that the tactic of boycott is actually an Irish, yeah. an Irish um, tactic. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know to... I would need to read up on my history a bit on it, but uh, like the, the I, I understand that was part of the land war, uh, what was known, and it, that that went on for decades, like uh, of a kind of low intensity war, occasionally with uh, with all kinds of tactics, including like um, armed struggle, but often uh, community activism or, or just bringing communities together to you know, people who had very little power, like this was. Um, I guess like a lot of isolated rural communities who were under the boot of um, military occupation or uh, but also completely vicious landlords and a horrible system but they were able to resist it very effectively um so i don't know like i think uh, approaching that from a like you know what we know about uh, revolutionary struggle like i'm sure that has lots of we could analyze that with you know like let's say people's war type um of an, of an analysis and find some history of Ireland that could probably be reapplied today. Yeah, and it's probably one of the biggest, um, probably the busy, busy, biggest examples of a class war in Ireland was the land war, where you had these massive landlords, the majority of which were British, um, and huge, huge sections of the population, the majority of the population who didn't own the land they worked on had to pay massive rents, and this, this obviously this situation to the to the to the genocide. But like this, that was probably one of the biggest aspects of class war in Ireland, possibly before the Dublin lockout in 1913. So yeah, as you said, there was various different tactics were used during the land war. And even if you look at it from contemporary perspective, like back then you had these massive landlords in the country, right in the countryside, majority of which were British. And there was a huge amount of um, deprivation in the country. 2019, we have massive corporations, vulture funds coming into the country who are owning huge uh, properties, apartments all across Dublin, all across the country. People have no interest in Ireland, no interest in the country and they're, these are, they're charging massive exorbitant um, rents for people just to live in their own country. So it's basically just what we're living in now is a continuation of that class struggle, only the class is, is slightly, has changed slightly differently. Exactly. And it just, I mean, 
and like people should know that uh, that kind of situation like you described for the rule for the Irish political class that's a good thing like they want this to happen this is a success in their eyes the fact that you're being evicted from your house or you're paying like a massive percentage of your salary just uh, for like probably low quality like really crappy uh, rented accommodation uh, this is a good thing for them so that's why you need to put your stop propping up their system and we need to build build our own like because otherwise you're going to live in a hellish situation for like for decades that's that's their plan they want they, they're very happy for you to to stay completely miserable um and that that's what it will happen unless we all organize ourselves to to to, to change that yeah. and it shows you how much has a little has changed in Ireland since then as well at the end of the 1880s that you have a situation where the six counties are an occupied uh, colonial mini state or state of and the 26 counties are semi-colonial. It's completely at the whims of British imperialism, American imperialism, and EU imperialism. So even though the class, that class war in the countryside, the agrarian struggle has subsided a bit, and at the moment we see the farmers, the small farmers especially, having to blockade um, certain processing plants, um, the class struggle in Ireland continues to, to um, exist and to actually possibly increase uh, contradictions between the real class and the working class in the 26 counties and the six counties continues to increase. Yeah, that's all. Also, in the inter international news, in Bolivia, last time Socialist Republican Radio um, was out, the coup against Evo Morales had recently happened, and since then things have deteriorated in Bolivia. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's been a, about a month since the coup happened. Incidentally, you'll notice that American media won't refer to it as a coup because that's a legal thing. Like if they, if it's, uh, if it's called a coup, um, they legally can't give the government any money. Um, and there's lots of fake uh, progressive media will refer to, will refuse to call it a, a coup as well. But, um, well, yeah, so, so since this, uh, this is a, a right-wing uh, fascist, a Christian fascist coup, um, those forces are strong in Bolivia. The, the population of Bolivia, Bolivia is majority indigenous um, of, different, uh, of different indigenous peoples. And Evo's government was quite good on, it was very good on, on lots of this. So they made it a, a plurinational, um, it went from a, a, a semi-feudal um, European run uh, state in its history to become a, a plurinational one, which um, took into account the different um, religions and uh, languages and clothings and ways of life of the different um, indigenous peoples there, um, which which is what was, uh, so that's what uh, the Evo had had um, achieved. But this coup is by a right wing uh, fascist Christians of evangelical or like if they're Catholics. The very like very corrupt um, uh, parts of the of the church uh, hierarchy. So yeah, they've they've banned. So since the uh, coup, they have banned indigenous dress. Uh, they've reverted back to uh, to officially calling itself a Christian nation of, of uh, re rejecting the um, the. The different uh, religions of the different of the indigenous peoples there. Um, there has been mass attacks against uh, indigenous peoples. Um, they have also re-established relations with Israel. Uh, Evo about uh, ten years ago had um, cut off relations with Israel and was threatening to take them to the International Court of Human Rights. Um, and yeah, so so they've done a whole so so this is like inevitable stuff because like these guys are are fascists and comprador capitalists. So this is like what they would do. Um, like we're not uh, not 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 to be surprised. Like you know, if a, if a, you you wouldn't be surprised that like a, a scorpion would 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 bite would sting you. Um, and yeah, well. Yeah, so this is this is the reason why. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, this is the reason why uh, the 
peoples of Bolivia needed to be armed to defend themselves. And unfortunately, that had, hadn't happened under Evo's government, so they've been uh, defenseless. Um, you were saying there about the difference between Venezuela and Bolivia, and um, that the uh, Venezuelans had initiated um, a process of arming the ordinary people in Venezuela, and how that basically saved the country in comparison to Bolivia. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a it, it, it's a huge uh, difference. It, it's a, it's a it, these two like neighboring com com countries both had elected in the socialists as part of their their governments on the backs of. Um, uh, popular popular movements had formed parties and, and they got elected in. So you can see these two countries uh, comparing with each other. But the difference being, I guess in Venezuela, Hugo Chavez was organizing within the Venezuelan military, and I they seem to as well have ha, have had a, a bit of there were like um, kind of self defense groups and and so on in uh, like in in Venezuela anyway, like. Um, I think they're called colectivos, or um, there were groups like political groups called the, the Venezuelan Tup Tupamaros. Um, didn't seem to have, have happened in in. So, so what, what they have done in Venezuela, for one thing, they were arming the people. Um, so people in work, working class neighborhoods were able to get uh, weaponry, like a, be officially recognized as self defense militias, because they were under attack by. Um, by various fascists, uh, like from who come out from the rich areas uh, to to try and attack them, um, there is also a high crime rate in Venezuela. Uh, so, so, so the communities themselves were able to defend themselves, and they got training from the Venezuelan military, not to to, to turn themselves into something like not just a kind of rabble, but like to give them effective training. And the other aspect was that um, they brought the Venezuelan military. To, to take a more social, like they call themselves, the, the, the Venezuelan soldiers now call themselves socialist, and they were um, given work to do by the government to build uh, projects with the people. So they were in contact with the people, they were building, they were literally building housing together with the people, for example, or, or doing civil defense works. So the Venezuelan military and the Venezuelan people were, were brought together, which is like one of the, so the Venezuelans weren't um, Maoists, let's say, but that's one of the key things that the people, without a people's army, the people have nothing. So at least this is what they have done. And so, we, yeah, whereas it just it wasn't done in in, uh, in Bolivia and the people were unfortunately like defenseless to, to these uh, to these fascists. So, yeah, you can see the two, two, two beside each other. Yeah, it's a wonder, even Evo Morales, social, Demo uh, social Democrat, do you think even Considering the history of Latin America and the history of right wing coups, that that never crossed his mind that there was a strong possibility that was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, some of the some of the criticism, the legitimate criticism of Evo Morales is that he didn't touch capitalism that much, or like his kind of form of building socialism was very slow. He did leave a lot of uh, he didn't. Um, it wasn't like that radical, like economically. He did increase like social welfare and stuff, which is very, very good for, for people who are very poor, but still it wasn't uh, changing the fundamental relations. But yeah, I mean, I guess uh, we've seen all across, like, I mean, I guess since the since 1999, the so-called pink tide across Latin America, but all of these governments have been kicked out. They, I mean, yeah, so hopefully, I mean, I guess uh, revolutionaries would have said it for a long time, but uh, yeah, they were never like the big one would have been the Workers Party in Brazil, which did a lot of progressive stuff, but it was it was um, you know the equivalent of like the Labour Party, like so Social Democrats. But uh, I don't yeah they 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 did a lot of progressive stuff, but they also like re reached out to the made sure to tell the business leaders that they weren't really going to touch things, so they thought that it would uh, they would be accepted, but they never were. So they just they were just uh, kicked out. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I guess people need to. To learn lessons, really. Mm -hmm. I could just say, just on, on Bolivia as well. Um, just one thing about it was that the campaign. I don't know. I think this touches on uh, color revolutions and, and, and uh, these various global counter revolutions, which are dressed up as uh, you know, given a spin that they're actual revolutions. It's a, it's a thing. It's a thing which is tried time and time again. 
and it was definitely tried in Bolivia. So the month before the coup against Evo Morales happened, there was a big campaign um, globally among stuff like uh, groups like Extinction Rebellion, which are becoming popular now, and the so-called progressive media, like you know the Guardian, for example, would be would have been a big mouthpiece of it. But to say that uh, Evo Evo Morales was a they described him as ecocidal, and they described it as an eco genocide. Like so, this uh, they were claiming that uh, Evo was. They're trying to put the blame on all of the environmental destruction that's happening across the world, trying to put it, the blame on Evo Morales, who, I mean, again, like, I don't agree with, like, he is a, a social democrat, like, an elected social democrat, but wouldn't have um, be much in agreement with those kind of politics, but it's, it's completely disgusting for them to, 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 to try and to, to, to do this to them. Um, and so that was just a way that they, this, these groups like, so groups like um, Extinction Rebellion, which have very poor politics and also which are backed by a wing of the capitalist class, like they're not really looking for, if you look at what they're about, they're like a popular movement to fund eco-capitalism and eco-technology and so on. It's not, it's not a for nature or for environmentalism or it's a very it's a very fake kind of environmentalism but they were basically this was one of the the ways to um evaporate support for um this this country before they were able to launch this coup i mean they also brought in uh, every other all of the the, the spokespeople of these like the, the so-called like progressive media they would wheel out um supposedly like feminists in, you know, Bolivian feminists um, who it turns out were actually like elite funded, um, like from NGOs in Bolivia, which are sponsored by the US government for the purpose of, um, uh, well, regime change anyway. So ju just right. uh, just to say that that was, that was a big part of, of, of how they were able to get away with this, uh, this war against uh, Bolivia. I was just about to ask, or I just mentioned there about, you mentioned there about NGOs, a lot of these non-governmental organizations who are all funded by uh, governments. Like anywhere you see a conflict, especially a conflict where you see an imperialist power um, trying to wield its influence on a certain area, you're bound to find an NGO, um, like the likes of Ukraine, Syria, Bolivia, any of these countries where an imperialist power is basically interfering in a, a sovereign nation's um, business. You'll find these NGOs, and even in Ireland, the, the groups go back to the 70s, such as Peace People, all these groups seem to uh, pop up as kind of like a, a, well, obviously a liberal kind of controlled opposition to any form of national self determination or national sovereignty, nearly. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, I mean, I think uh, it's been pointed out they're they're like one of the biggest industries in the world. Like I mean, they employ because they employ so many people, like through some contract. Like they, they, there could be like up to a billion people employed by these guys. Uh, is one thing. Also, they're one of the most well-funded things because due to uh, like whenever you see like I mean it's it's uh, in the newspapers a lot that like you know seven people own have own half as much. Um, uh, money as the uh, you know on, on, on as much as you know half the, the world's population so about 3.5 billion pop, uh, per, uh, people but um, the but the and, and yeah so all these like super phenomenally super wealthy people um, they're giving they're they're putting they're reinvesting their this money into NGOs which is not to do good it's to perpetuate their system and um, increase their control they're not giving anything away they're they're um, keeping the money but they're they're putting it into a different wing of, of investments um, and yeah so so but they do they can do so many different things with these NGOs so like some of it is just to um, so like similar to charities or whatever or like for example whenever um, the US will invade a country they'll 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 put in like a whole bunch of end, like they'll destroy a country. They'll destroy their electricity system, their health system, their everything. 
they'll completely d destroy. So they'll bring in a bunch of NGOs to try and fill in the gaps. So like that's one thing that they do. They also do they, and they do that in a horrible way. Um, one example is like in the in the country of Haiti, after um, they had a, an earthquake in 2010. Ha Haiti uh, is known as the NGO Republic because everything of their government has been has been privatized and, and put into the hands of NGOs. Um, so, for example, uh, the International Red Cross took in they were they were begging for donations for for everyone after this happened. They took in half a billion dollars, like five hundred million uh, dollars, and they built six houses with it. So, like you know, the, the level of corruption is is crazy. But that's that's one aspect that they do. But they also have kind of um, do various kind of propaganda type things, like Amnesty International is a good example. So whenever the U.S. is going to destroy a country, they'll Amnesty International, like months before, will wheel out some kind of report saying like talking about human rights abuses. Um, but you know, they, they they also like they kind of mutate or whatever. Like they're they, they're developing new kinds of NGOs all the time. So like probably the White Helmets is a is a good example in, in, in Syria, like this kind of fake uh, rescue group, which used, uh, which was, it was more or less like actors who would like put cameras on their heads and, <laughs> and try and act out various um, rescue situations as a way to, uh, I don't know, build support for like uh, military uh, destruction of the Syrian government. But it, there's, there's all kinds of crazy new combinations because I guess the whole NGO industry is, is so well funded from both from governments and from billionaires, that they are developing all kinds of new and weird things all the time. Yeah, there's a few examples from Ireland as well, in the past 40, 30, 40 years, where you have, for the likes of, say, Belfast in the 80s, Kevin Bean in his book, The New Politics Student Fame, goes into it um, quite in depth, and he talks about how the Republican movement set up a lot of these community groups um, that were independent of the state, independent of the British state, and how eventually they were subsumed into the state and just became a branch of the state that money was thrown at a lot of these community groups. Community groups started competing for money, or so-called NGOs would have set up their own community groups and would have acted as a branch of the state itself. So the same way that certain independent political parties are being consumed into the state and become a branch of the state, trade unions, trade unions, some radical trade unions started off as being independent of the state, being subsumed into the into the state again, but just become a branch of the state itself. And the same happens with these community groups, um, like in, in the likes of Republican areas, nationalist areas, and the six occupied counties has happened there, where they've just become um, part of the infrastructure of the occupational forces. And even in the south of Dublin during the anti-drugs campaign, that we saw that when the state started providing funding to a lot of these community groups or anti-drugs groups, that it was then that they started to take a different route. And obviously, they couldn't be independent of the state. They couldn't become critical of the state in any way. That they were reliant on funding for them to pursue whatever policies or whatever reforms they were trying to exact from the state itself. And now, of course, the state's removed all its funding. So, like you know, it's gone full circle. Like you know. Once they suck you in, like you know, there's uh, yeah, the the you know, the capitalist states are unsustainable, so they will always like revert back to austerity, and they'll just cut your funding, and then you'll be left uh, back where you started, but but worse. Yeah. Like, you know, everything you've done over the last like 20, 30 years will be will be for nothing. And it's a complete fl um, flip of people's mentality as well. If uh, some kind of structure is developed independent of the state and then all of a sudden it's become completely reliant on the state and that's a completely different perspective to have that if you're completely reliant on the state then that you look to the state for dependency and you rely on that state to provide you for whatever rights you think you're entitled to so it's a complete flip of um, a mindset to have Yeah, I think that um, well, like for one thing it should be clear that most of these NGOs are constructed as uh, alternatives like competitors to revolutionary groups so they're like they're they're competing for for people who want to who realize that this system is met badly it's, it's a bad system and it needs to change um, they could be going down the revolutionary path or but they'll also be trying to get sucked down a or kind of the, an NGO path which is supposedly radical but but won't be at the same time any uh, revolutionary movement like would have some kind of would have to 
be in a broad front with lots of groups and that would include lots of people with not groups with not 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 great with with uh, not great politics and it probably would include like some NGOs so I don't know to, to a certain extent I guess it it uh, it depends like the uh, it depends on the leadership like you know if it's uh, for example overall if it is as long as it's the working class in control uh, or taking the leadership then it can be in a joint um, it can uh, in, a, in a, an alliance with other classes then then th that overall will have good politics but if it's for example if the revolutionary movement is uh, like the petty bourgeoisie like the kind of middle classes um then but with the with the working class um following them then that will that will be a bad it, that, that that will lead to deviations or that, that will produce like the, the wrong results and similarly um if it's if it's uh, political groups in, in in a particular like united front who are taking the lead of it then then it can be like that these ngos can play like some ngos can play a progressive role within that but it all depends on, on like what the leadership and what the direction is is is, is going yeah, i think that's that's really important the leadership and the direction i think um james connolly said that is the strength of your march is an importance the direction it's going in so like for example in dublin with the homeless crisis at the moment so many people homeless there's a lot of well-meaning and well-intentioned people who do a lot for homeless people provide food and they provide clothing and this kind of thing and there's charities have propped up dozens of charities and the inner city have propped up to look after homeless people but in a way i don't i'm not saying they're doing it at the service but they're nearly filling the vacuum of the state where the state should be providing homes for people and they shouldn't be reliant on people to give up their own free time and provide um the ba most basic needs for homeless people are people who are living in poverty at the moment that basically there needs to be a whole change of system for that for that problem to be alleviated. Well, that's why I mean one of the best. Uh, yeah, we still haven't figured out how to do that. Like, what needs to happen is we need to. Uh, like, life is hell for so many people. Like, either on the streets or being threatened with going onto the streets, or even if they're renting, it's still miserable. They're they're paying a huge amount of money for terrible, unhealthy, cramped accommodation. And what needs to happen is. Uh, we need to find the people responsible and, and, and make their lives hell. Um, but uh, so we haven't figured out how to do that yet. But uh, the like uh, a thing pointing the way would be the the, the bring it to their doors uh, campaign, which uh, has shown like even a small amount we've been able to show some of the people who are responsible for this. Um, give them a little a, a little. Pointer. Uh, I wouldn't even say like a, a taste, but like you know, just just um, yeah, ma making them aware that. Uh... I think I think that someone said that um, injustice has a face and an address. So it's not as if these this system that we exist in now just came out of nowhere. Like the, what we live in now is a system that people perpetuate. That people have sat down. And devised and they've implemented these policies where thousands of people are homeless thousands of people are living from wage to wage just to pay for their mortgage so the situation we live in is the result of people's decisions politicians decisions and that, that class that the politicians represent in and in this country and internationally a lot of the time the decisions are made not even in ireland but in, in other countries or other jurisdictions and the other aspect is like you know and that just to say again like for the people who are the managerial class over here, like the politicians, th this horrible situation for you, that's a good result for them. That's what they want. That's a good thing. And we're not, you're not going to be able to reform or negotiate or like, they're not mistaken. Like they know what they're doing. Like, and this is like, they, 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 A, they don't care about you, except the only real thing that they care about you is that you're paying your, your, that you're, you're paying a huge amount of rent and, and taxes. That's the extent. Like they don't care about your misery, and they're not going to, um, like you're, you're not going to make them aware or or try and uh, like negotiate a better thing with them. Like you know, you have to. Uh, we overall need to, to to struggle with them. And I think during the Thatcher, apart from murdering ten Republican hunger strikers, like her legacy with the British or the working class in in Britain. She said that society doesn't exist anymore, and you see it's increasing in Ireland where. 
everything is put on the individual that if you're living in poverty or if you have a problem, it's 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 your fault, it's the individual's fault where society in general there's there's no sense of community or the sense of community is kind of being eroded, that everyone everyone is on their own and it's it's intentional policy by the establishment to, to make to make everyone feel to alienate and to make them not feel part of the community that you, you don't have the same collective rights or you shouldn't have the same collective rights as anyone else in your community or in your area. Yep, exactly. And they've done a they've done a, a pretty good job of it. Like you know, they have destroyed lots of communities, like broken people apart. We've we become iso- uh, completely isolated from each other, and isolated. Like we've we've overall we've forgotten our own history. We've forgotten, and we don't know our own power. But um, that's a, a very bad thing. But it's it's to some extent it's also a good thing. Like we have, we can we can grow really fast, uh, really fast if we if we can put together the right structures for people to empower themselves and to come together. Then I think that revolutionary movements can grow very fast in that kind of a situation. I think one of the policies that the establishment have they've introduced all across the Western world, but it's starting to become more prevalent in Ireland is uh, gentrification. So you see, especially in the city centre at the moment, where everyone knows there's a, ho- a housing crisis, but th- there's no political will by the establishment because why should there be their class interested in being met and they're happily sitting on um, the proceeds of the profits that they make from people's rent and from the misery that people are living through. So the policy of gentrification you can see in Dublin, all around the city centre, where huge student accommodation is going up in right in the middle of the city centre, huge rents where not even Irish students, who majority of whom come from middle class and well-off backgrounds, can afford. So it's mostly international students who are going to be able to afford these, these wages in the city centre. So in the city centre, as these huge student accommodation complexes are going up, People who have possibly might have a council house, they're, if they were to sell the council house, take or, take a mortgage out, the, the price for those houses would probably skyrocket and be huge. So a lot of those people more than likely might think of selling their house. So that means the inner city communities would be completely wiped out, that you'd just have possibly students living in the, the inner city and transient type workers where we saw the 26 county free state government uh, were thinking of bringing introducing these types of uh, dormitory accommodations and he said it would be perfect for transient type workers so IT workers from other countries who might have a contract in the 26 counties to live there for a few days so these massive corporations could make massive profits while they're working here then these people who are living in these accommodations could earn lambs but fuck off back to wherever they came from and these corporations would take these huge profits for the short period of time that these people work there, whereas people in the inner city or in Ireland in general won't have any type of security or no job security or no type of um, security when it comes to owning a home or having a home. Yeah, and uh, I mean, yeah, so yeah, the, I think people need to be clear that like, uh, they're they're building, uh, like they're, they're, the plans for the, how how Dublin is already, for example, um, yeah, they're building a two tier, uh, like a two class, kind of economic apartheid type city, where you have high, like incredibly luxuri- luxurious, um, offices and apartment areas and clean walkways and cycle paths and little gardens and landscaped streets, and they're gonna if there's any working class areas that they can't their first option would be to just bulldoze any working class areas and kick the people out to the middle of nowhere um, if they can't do that they just will put barbed wire and have cops and private security turning them into little ghettos like that's what the that's what Dublin is already and it's going to become more so like that um, and, and like yeah so just that's that's what our that's what the plan is for the city for for our country so People need to organise to stop that from happening because that's what's going to happen. Uh, that's what the plan is, unless we disrupt it. Yeah. And I think no amount of reforms would really change that. No amount of people say you can change the, the government system is always going to stay the same. So the, the system that exists now will will exist until 
the, it's uprooted from from the roots out. Like the, the class that are are what you call the political class politicians, their interests are being met at the time being. They don't want to see a complete a radical change of the system that exists now. So it's not their interest to change it. So and most politicians are the exact same. They came from they come from the same same class that currently hold the reins of power. Yeah. No, I, I think, as well, I, I think people, to some extent, we should be optimistic, I think, to some extent, like, they're, they're, they haven't had very much organized pushback. Uh, we haven't, sh people haven't shown their own, uh, their own power. So, in reality, like, they're, they're very weak. So, we, we as we organize ourselves, and we take, uh, but organize ourselves, uh, on the right path, like with radical and very targeted actions, like against the the people who are doing this to us, then we can make a lot. We can change that a lot. But but their system it, it can seem very powerful, uh, but it hasn't been tested. So um, there's a lot. There's I think yeah we can we can change a lot from it. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. Yeah, and it is a paper tiger. And we like we've seen even in Ireland, we mentioned it before that. Um, a lot of the time, especially Irish people, I suppose, in general, um, wouldn't be very good about claiming their victories. And we've had a number of victories and campaigns, political campaigns, over the past number of years. You could claim the water tax debacle has been one. Obviously, it would be a long, protracted struggle. But we saw uh, there was a huge mobilisation of, of people that I'd never seen. And uh, to be honest, I never thought I would see for a, a long, long time where people came out and actively engaged in, in a form of struggle. And before that, there was the property tax, where it was the, one of the biggest forms of boycott in, across the whole of Europe. The water tax claim was the same; was one of the biggest forms of mass disobedience across Europe. And I know Irish people were getting a bad rep, especially when you consider 26 countries were paying 40 percent of the European bank debt. But there was instances there where it was the biggest um, form of mass disobedience, of boycotting tax from the state, which. If you consider that and the boycott, the boycott that people already are pursuing when it comes to elections, there's a clear, um, I wouldn't say apathy, there's a clear rejection of the institutions of the state. And there always has been in Ireland, there's always an instinctive anti-imperialist sentiment and a kind of healthy, healthy disregard or a healthy disrespect for authority. And you'll, it'll always be there in Ireland, it's just a matter of directing and organising. Yeah, so uh, I think yeah, people who are listening may, like maybe don't feel disempowered or depressed. Like even if the situation is 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 bleak, like maybe for yourself or for um, the country overall, um, like we can build ourselves. Like we can build ourselves movements to um, to actually take power into our own hands. So we have the right with the right. Um, level with the right kind of ideology and theory and thinking like for example you, you you mentioned like Ireland compared to yeah back in the austerity protests like you know uh, people in Greece were saying we're not like Ireland and Greece had like um, amazing like mass movements of people uh, um, getting active in the streets and taking radical actions but at the same time it, it didn't it didn't go anywhere, so we have to ask the question why. Like, so I mean, uh, so this let, so just just to uh, to say that even if people uh, become uh, educated and active and start mobilizing and, and and doing things, we also need to have the right put it into the right uh, right structures and have the right uh, the right way to do things. Because unfortunately, we can still be knocked back to to, to zero. If we if we don't.